please feel free. Um, so I'll start. We have Commissioner Susan Rodriguez McDowell. Um, she's on the Health and Human Services Committee. Okay. And we have Jessica New Payne. Um, she is an educator with Planned Parenthood. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, and we have Christina Adeleke. Um, she is with NC AIDS Action Network. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Um, and then next up would be Meg Sullivan, um, Dr. Meg Sullivan, I should say. I apologize. Um, and she is the medical director of Mecklenburg um, County Public Health. Good evening. <laughs> And um, last but most certainly not least, we have Jennifer Rogers de la Hara. Um, she is on the school board. She is actually our at-large member for the county. Hello. Yay, awesome. So glad to have you guys. Thank you so much again. Um, so first, um, we'll start by just, you know, giving you a brief video to kind of provide some context. Um, this one will kind of allude to what contraceptives are available out there, um, and then we'll turn to a couple of questions. So we'll go ahead and play that real quick. So you want to have sex, but how can you make sure you're safe? Contraceptives are methods used to prevent pregnancy and in some cases prevent sexually transmitted infections or STIs. Almost 50% of teenagers aged 15 to 19 have experienced sexual intercourse. However, only about 78 to 85% of them use contraceptives. Having unprotected sex can put you at risk of unwanted pregnancy or contracting an STI. This video will review common methods of contraception, how they work, and how effective they are. Although there's lots of different types of sex, this video will pertain specifically to penis and vagina sex. Contraceptive effectiveness is assessed in two ways, perfect and typical use. Perfect use is the use of a contraceptive exactly as the manufacturer intended. Typical use factors in human error. Typical use would be like building a chair without following the instructions. It may turn out fine, but it may also break when you try to sit on it. There are two main categories of contraceptives, physical barriers and hormonal contraceptives. The first category is physical barriers. Physical barriers act to physically block the sperm from meeting the egg. A common type of physical barrier is a condom, which captures ejaculated semen. Condoms must be removed after sex and cannot be reused. There are two main types of condoms, the external condom, which is rolled onto an erect penis before intercourse, and the internal condom, which is inserted into the vagina and sits at the opening of the cervix on one end and covers the external genitalia on the other. This type of condom can be inserted eight hours before sexual intercourse. With perfect use, the external condom is approximately 98% effective, and the internal condom is 95% effective. However, with typical use, the external condom has an effectiveness closer to 82%, whereas the internal condom has an effectiveness around 79%. Condoms can also greatly reduce the risk of contracting an STI, with protection being 85% greater in comparison to no condom use. Condoms can be purchased for a relatively low price without the need for prescription. The second category of contraceptives are hormonal methods. These methods involve two hormones that regulate the reproductive cycle, estrogen and progesterone. Hormonal contraceptives release either progestin and estrogen or progestin alone. Estrogen will prevent the release of an egg, so there's nothing to fertilize. Progestin will cause the uterine mucus to thicken and stop sperm from reaching the egg. Within this category, there are oral contraceptive pills, internal contraceptives, and transdermal contraceptives. It is important to note that no form of hormonal contraceptive will protect you against STIs. The first subtype is oral contraceptives. These include the combination pill and the mini pill. The combination pill contains both estrogen and progestin, while the mini pill contains only progestin. Both forms of oral contraceptives are 99.7% effective with perfect use and 92% effective with typical use. In order for either of these pills to be effective, they have to be taken at the same time each day. These pills are typically taken for three weeks and not taken for the fourth week. The second subtype is internal contraceptives. These include the intrauterine device and birth control rings. 
intrauterine devices, also known as IUDs, are more than 99% effective with perfect use. They are T-shaped devices which are inserted into the uterus by a trained physician. There are two types of IUDs, hormonal and copper. Hormonal IUDs function by releasing progestin, while copper IUDs function by creating an inflammatory response in the cervix, which kills the sperm, and altering the cervical mucus to inhibit sperm motility. IUDs are reversible and can be used for up to five years for hormonal and 10 years for copper. Birth control rings are small, flexible rings that can be inserted into the vagina without a physician. They release estrogen and progestin and are kept in for three weeks and removed for the fourth. Birth control rings are 99.7% effective with perfect use and 92% effective in typical use. The third subtype is transdermal contraceptives, which includes the transdermal patch. The patch releases both estrogen and progestin and is applied every week for three weeks and left off for the fourth week. It is 99.7% effective with perfect use and 92% effective with typical use. Talk to your doctor to find out which hormonal birth control is the best for you. Emergency postcoital contraceptives, such as Plan B, can be used in the case where you've had unprotected sex or contraceptive measures have failed. Plan B can be taken up to 72 hours after the contraceptive failure on protected sex. Plan B works by preventing ovulation and if taken within 24 hours, it is 95% effective. In summary, there are two main types of contraceptives, physical and hormonal. We have listed these contraceptives from least to most effective. As you can see here, the internal condom is the least effective, followed by the external condom. Hormonal contraceptives are very similar in terms of effectiveness and fall second only to abstinence from sex, which is 100% effective. In an emergency scenario, Plan B may be used, which is 95% effective within 24 hours. I strongly encourage you to practice safe sex by using contraceptives to protect against unwanted pregnancies and STIs. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. That was great. All right. So we'll turn to a couple questions now from Susan Rodriguez McDowell. Um, so Susan, could you provide us with an understanding of where the county currently sits on access to contraceptives? Sure. Um, and I'd love it if uh, Dr. Sullivan will correct me on anything that I'm, I'm not fully informed on. Um, but um, the, uh, currently, um, uh, there's a sliding scale offered for contraception. And so, uh, but it's still not extremely affordable for folks who um, find themselves in poverty or, you know, they're, not everyone can afford it still, even though it's on a sliding scale. Um, so, and um, maybe Dr. Meg can help me uh, with this one. Is emergency contraception even offered right now? Apologies, I was on mute. Um, yes, if we're talking specifically at the health department clinics, um, we do offer emergency contraception. Yeah. Okay, and is that on the sliding scale? Correct. Yes, okay. I mean, it can be, yes, it is, can be provided at no cost to anybody that can um, afford it. Okay. Oh, so you can get it at, at no cost? Correct. Okay. At the health department. Uh, um, it's available at, it, you know, at pharmacies and other places um, at, for a cost, or if you can get it through a prescription, then some insurances do pay for it. But at the health department, yes. Okay, great. So that's, that's great to know. Awesome. Great. Um, so the next question for you, Susan, is just going to be more of um, a follow-up question on that, which is, um, how do you feel Mecklenburg County could improve upon this? What opportunities do you feel we have to do better? Well, I definitely feel that we need to make sure that access is paramount to anyone who wants access. And that includes, you know, our teen population, um, without having parental consent. Um, I think it's really important that anyone who wants uh, contraceptives can get them. And so I think if we, can, if we can get to where it's zero cost for folks who can't afford for any type of contraception, I think that would be the best uh, goal for us to have. Absolutely, great. Um, so I don't know if Susan needs to hop off here. I know she's going to go celebrate her mother's birthday. Um, so make sure you tell her that we all said happy 80th birthday. Um, 
but we will let you um, bow out now if you'd like. But thank you again, Susan. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Yeah, sure thing. And let me just say, um, you know, I, I really think that our Health and Human Services Committee, which I serve on um, it, it, with uh, Dr. Vilma Leek is our chairwoman. And um, I would really like to see if we could get her to take this topic on you know, one of our committee meetings, and maybe we could invite you guys to come and speak with us and, and just see where, where are the holes that Mecklenburg County has that maybe we can advocate to fill. Um, I think it's super important that we are based in science and research. And I really want to make sure that we are using, um, you know, really strong messaging around that. And, um, and, and I think that, you know, attacking the root problem of unplanned pregnancies is is really and I think we've done that some I think you know I, I would love to see and maybe you're going to cover this of, of how unplanned pregnancies are um, are dropping um, I was really heartened to hear that 78 to 85 percent of youth are using contraception I didn't realize it was that high so that's kind of good but we need to get it higher so um, anyways, thank you. And uh, I will come back and watch uh, what you all talk about um, because I really am interested, especially in what CMS, uh, what you guys talk about. I'd like to come back and hear that. I think that'll be really important. So, so I hope that we can do um, a health and human services meeting soon and I'll see if I can get that put on our calendar um, if you guys are interested. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Thank you. I'm yes. almost positive we'll be taking you up on that. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Well, thanks so much. And sorry to be cutting out early, but I'll tell my mom that you guys wish her a happy 80th. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Susan. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Awesome. All right, and so now we will um, cut to another brief video um, before diving into the next set of questions. Um, this second video here is going to look at the impact of how expanding access to contraceptives lowers unplanned pregnancies and allows people to take control over their bodies. The biggest lie I was told about sex? The biggest lie I was told about sex was... Like, nobody told me a lie about sex. I think society frames sex in a way that it's a lie. It was probably through my Catholic school education. It's just based on, uh, please, uh, a man. It's just a patriarchal society. They told me it was always between a man and a woman that loved each other and just to make babies. With every person I would have sex with, I was gonna feel a connection with them or I was gonna like have feelings for them. That's totally not true because I've had sex with people and I feel absolutely nothing for them afterwards. And then you and Emily are gonna talk about the intersections and how that affects us. And is, are, is that gonna lead into doing the art and stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good? Yeah, I got it. Okay, so, sorry, uh, we're gonna get ready to start okay. if you wanna like transition and... Thank you for coming out. I'm like happy to see new faces. We are the Los Angeles chapter of California for uh, Latinas for Reproductive Justice. We and uh, focus on Karina, reproductive justice and Edna, Alina. These are some of the women of the California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. And a new generation of women speaking out for their right to parent or not parent and to own their sexuality. Three, fists up in the air. Hey, I hate onion. I want that tomato. So you three met in school. How did you become friends? We we question and we we challenge the professor in the class. So you three were you three were you three were rabble rousers, and that attracted to you, that attracted you to each other. I said something, and then they kind of just all jumped on my back, and that's kind of. A lot of times, people will decide to not say anything so they don't feel uncomfortable. So I, th I think in that way, we became a support system for each other as well. Birth control and contraception have been sort of liberating concepts for women in this country. Would you say that that has applied to all people in this country? I think it's um, more than liberation. It's a necessity um, because, it's a right. uh, and it's a right, right? Um, I'm, a, I'm a working mother. I'm also a student. Um, if I don't have birth control, it's just another burden placed on me. 
it's more about, you know, we can't really afford to have another kid. Um, we need to take this um, birth control in order to plan accordingly with the needs and um, the kind of circumstances of our families. There were a lot of laws that were efforts to control people's sexual behavior. Family planning means more than you may have thought. There were many states that did not allow birth control at all. It was against the law for anyone to have access to or use birth control of any sort. And that stayed true until 1965 when the Supreme Court ruled that a state could not deny married couples the right to use birth control. It wasn't until 1972 that the Supreme Court revisited that issue and lifted the ban on single people. There were those who were afraid that it would create promiscuity, especially for young women. It was a very gendered kind of social stigma that attached to sexual activity outside of marriage. One of the prevailing myths about the birth control pill is that it caused the sexual revolution. We have no evidence that anyone actually went out and said, oh boy, I can get the pill now, I can go find someone to have sex with. With contraceptive technologies, it doesn't really change anyone's behavior. For sexually active people, whether they were married or single, the birth control pill made it possible for them to be sexually active without being terrified that they were going to get pregnant. And that was a real benefit. A benefit that in America today is fraught with racial, ethnic, and income disparities. Latinas are nearly twice as likely to experience an unintended pregnancy as white women. Black women are more than two times as likely. And the lower income a woman has, the higher her chances of an unplanned pregnancy. <laughs> I think yeah, you can get more people working on the same, too. You need help with that. Yes. Concepts of, like, talking about, like, sexual health education and access to these vital services. It shames and blames young parents. You know, we oftentimes hear these, these statistics, right, that Latinas are, like, leading the rates of, of teen pregnancy. You also, in this narrative, you hear this framework of, oh, well, teen pregnancy leads to poverty, right? Or teen pregnancy leads to you not completing your education. For a lot of people that are young parents, um, a lot of them are already, like, living in conditions of, like, poverty, right? So for a lot of people, right, when they talk about preventing teen pregnancy, it's using a punitive framework that focuses on individual behavior rather than addressing those systemic barriers right. that are present. So it's this idea of, what type of woman or what type of family um, has the right to decide what their family is going to look like. And then our uh, policy and lawmakers always, you know, prop up that uh, false narrative of the welfare queen and like mm -hmm. how women are just trying to have a lot of babies to like leech off the system. It's just frustrating because it's yeah. like you really think that people want to be poor and sitting in a welfare <laughs> office for hours, yeah. filling out paperwork, being like uh, stigmatized and treated negatively. Uh, and I think that the more we talk about it, the more we deconstruct that, that stereotype and the more we can actually work towards actually making positive change. I went to an all-girls Catholic high school, which is, I think, a very common thing um, within, like, maybe, like, um, Latino communities. I received abstinence-only sex ed in my first two years of high school, so, um, and when it's abstinence-only, it just means nothing, right? Like, don't do it because, you know. Don't even think about doing it. Right, you're not supposed to until you're married and, you know, Christ is watching you and all that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I graduated and, um, you know, I never got that education, not just about what birth control to use, but a health care provider. I didn't have health care after high school. I did end up um, becoming pregnant with my son at um, 19 and I gave birth to him at 20. Okay, drop his son. Wow. And drop butterfly. It was a result of just where I was in life. I, was, you know, at that age, you're very impulsive. And if you're not taught early on how to be responsible and use these certain uh, birth control devices or methods, uh, you end up with that kind of result, right? <laughs> <laughs>
What are the biggest barriers to birth control and contraception? I think finances play a big role in it. I was a 20-year-old tw mom, <laughs> new mother. I, I wasn't. I couldn't afford $300 for an IUD, but we still live in a private insurance country. Yeah. So let's say I have state insurance, Medi-Cal. It's very hard to find a provider. They, they don't make it accessible for you at all. They don't make it easy for you at all to get an appointment. You really li have to fight tooth and nail just to get an appointment, just to find a doctor. Like when I wanted to get my IUDs the first time, it took me two months to get an appointment. It was ridiculous. I was like, I literally could have gotten pregnant by then. It would have been like too late. And Edna? Um, I was undocumented. I don't have any insurance. And I, I face a lot of the problems that undocumented women face here, like being suspicious about looking for help, because I say, like, is this going to affect me? Are they going to deport me? But I think in all of our stories, there's all the burden falls on us. Yeah. There's not so much emphasis on teaching um, young boys and men yeah. to also take responsibility for that. How likely do you think men will be to try different methods of contraception outside of um, condoms? Oh, well, I think it'll happen because I think women will um, kind of say, you know what, you need to take responsibility. Take control of your body. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There have been lots of new technologies. There have been injections and implants. There have been intrauterine devices. All kinds of new devices and compounds for contraception for women. And there have been no new technologies for men over the last century. Women um, have um, uh, shouldered most of the burden of um, their contraception, but men are ready to take uh, also part of that responsibility. Dr. Gunda Georg is leading a team of researchers working in the next frontier for contraception, a birth control pill for men. So it would give uh, couples and uh, men and women uh, more options than we have right now. The race to develop contraceptive technology for men is happening in labs across the country. And surveys show that the majority of men are ready and willing to try them. The male pill would be more reliable than condoms and the not exactly FDA approved pullout method. And unlike vasectomies, there's no surgery required. We're actually taking three main approaches. The first one is to reduce sperm count so that um, a man is no longer fertile because there are not enough sperm produced. The second approach is to prevent sperm from completely forming. And the third approach is to inhibit sperm motility. What you see on the left side is a normal movement of sperm. What you see on the right side is we have exposed uh, sperm to uh, an agent that we have developed. And as you can see, the sperm here does not move very much and sperm is um, paralyzed. I think the world needs it. People really uh, want to be in control of their lives and they want to also control uh, when they start their families. But for many women in America, that control is still not a reality. We find today that birth control is absolutely at the center of our polarized political environment. Obamacare also provides uh, birth control to women at no cost. Is that going to end or will that remain? I'm not going to get into all the little nitty gritty details of these things. Viagra is used to help a medical condition. That's why it's covered. Birth control is not a medical condition. Trump care might be one of the biggest assaults on women's health that we've seen yet. In the year 2000, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission ruled that employers who did not provide prescription contraceptives in their health insurance plans where other preventative care was offered were guilty of gender discrimination. I'm signing this bill for all the leaders who took up this cause through the generations. Starting in 2011, under the Affordable Care Act, insurance plans had to cover all FDA-approved forms of contraception with no co-pays for patients. 
But in 2014, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that certain for-profit corporations could claim freedom of religion and refuse to include birth control in their employees' health insurance plans. Increasing access to health care should not require employers or employees to choose between coverage and their conscience. Somehow, in recent years, birth control has been caught up in the politics around abortion. It's obvious that one of the best ways to avoid abortion is birth control, but birth control becomes part of this moral universe that has fed into the culture wars and political wars over social policy. These battles are not yet won. They are still raging. And that means the right to decide whether and when to give birth without government interference. Here we are in the 21st century, more than 50 years after the approval of the pill, and we still have struggles over access, affordability, and availability. What do you think about the fact that birth control and contraception have become such polarized, partisan issues? And politicized. Politicized issues. I think that's just kind of a continuation on what we can call a war on women. There's always been this kind of uh, counter action to put us back in our place, right? Uh, and when I say that, like uh, these traditional gender, gender roles that state that women are only supposed to be in the home, having kids and taking care of them. Well, I want to see tea. But I'm curious to hear other people's experiences yeah. as well. Any stigmas? I know y'all have, have experiences with this. Like for me, I can't imagine living life and feeling like you have to get married, you have to have a partner, and you have to stay with someone who treats you like shit just because that's what our culture says is okay. You and know? it's very much like um, influenced by religion, mm -hmm. and that's still what was get, being told to me. Like, no, well, you're supposed to only have sex within the institution of marriage. And the fact that they say, like, the institution of marriage, right, mm -hmm. um, that's the only place we're allowed or have permission as if we need permission to express ourselves. Like, this is something that's very natural to us. Like, we literally have one organ that's devoted to pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the fact that we don't even learn about that until maybe we're older and we find out on our own. What do you think needs to happen for all women to be able to have access to birth control and contraception? I think it needs to become part of whatever health care um, act is going to you know, go through Congress and be approved. It has to be seen as something necessary. Um, and normalized, I think. It's not just like, oh, it's a woman thing. No, this is just like, like everyone benefits from it. Yeah, and it's not a moral issue. It's a health issue. At the end of the day, the person making that decision is the individual, not the people in Washington, not your church. Um, it shouldn't pastors. be something people have to vote on. It should be a woman's choice or the person's choice mm -hmm. only point blank. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. A lot of great information in that video. All right. So, um, Christina, I'm going to turn to you for these questions. Um, so if you don't mind, um, could you explain to us and perhaps even provide some data or stats if you happen to be aware of some off the top of your head regarding the relations between um, contraceptives and STIs and just how big of a difference they make? Yes. Um, well, I mean, ultimately, contracept contraception and and um, contraception and STI transmission has some overlap, but there are some caveats, of course. Um, you know, with methods like condoms, that's been well established to have, um, you know, an effect on STI transmission as well as preventing unplanned pregnancies. But ultimately, it comes down to the use and making sure that the the barrier 
um, is used correctly. And that has a huge um, impact on, of course, STI transmission and unplanned pregnancies. Um, but with the other types of contraception, such as oral contraception, um, IUDs, um, other you know, injectables, other types, um, those tend to solely focus on, the, on preventing unplanned pregnancies versus STIs. But there has been some studies done on, on um, people who use IUDs in their condom use. Because um, with the IUD, as I mentioned earlier, it's only used to prevent unplanned pregnancies. But with the, with the other types, um, you know, you have to think about um, other factors as well and you know with with people who have an IUD and um, studies that have been done with that group specifically which unfortunately there aren't a lot of studies done <laughs> on a lot of these but that just shows that we need to invest more research and more funding to be able to research these things um, but there was a study that was found to show that people who use IUDs are half um, half less likely to use condoms as well to prevent um, STIs and other sexually transmitted diseases. Um, and then when it came to evaluating the actual STI transmission, they were twice as likely to have actually acquired a trans, uh, an STI compared to those who use condoms. So ultimately it's most important to, to cover cover this topic more comprehensively and not just to focus on, on contraception to, to do either prevent unplanned pregnancy or prevent STIs, but you know, we need to provide multiple options um, to provide people access to be able to cover both of those needs in a more comprehensive way. Absolutely. Great. So you kind of touched upon this and I'd really like to build upon that. Um, so we understand contraception <laughs> doesn't prevent HIV. Um, that would be more allocated toward condoms or PrEP. Um, but with that being said, how do you feel integrating PrEP and PEP into conversations about contraception um, relates to bodily autonomy and an individual's empowerment? Um, I, I approve. I approve of that message. I think it's very important um, to incorporate PrEP and PEP into the sexual health conversation more broadly. Um, with, with PrEP and PEP, um, both of those are used specifically to prevent the transmission of HIV um, and not other STDs and STIs. But it is important to note that most STDs and STIs, aside from herpes or HIV, are able to be cured and you know, there are treatments available. Um, but with herpes and HIV, you're able to live with those, but it's considered more of a managed condition. So being able to have an additional option, additional, additional tool to use to prevent HIV, specifically knowing that there isn't a cure yet, um, is, is nice to know. Particularly for people who, who um, are not in the position to be able to negotiate about not only sexual practices, but um, may not have autonomy in, in regards to their sexual relationships. I'm thinking of domestic violence situations. I'm thinking of situations where there is um, sexual abuse, physical abuse of any kind. Um, being able to know that you can take prep, you can take the choice and make the choice to do that and to be able to protect your own sexual health um, is empowering, I believe. And I think that knowing that it doesn't rely on another person um, and that it's solely in your hands is, is important. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to having access to comprehensive sex um, education and contraceptives, I also do think it's important to expand the perspectives of the people who we consider to be um, most impacted. I think that a lot of times the conversation is limited to women, 
Um, but in reality, it's, you know, people of all genders who, you know, need to cultivate their sexual health and protect their health. Um, and I think that the sexual education that is given needs to be inclusive of that and not solely limited on a binary type of scale um, to where we're talking about men and women um, and, you know, incorporating the fact that there are different types of relationships and different types of identities um, that need to be incorporated. Absolutely. Such great points. Thank you. Um, before I turn to Dr. Sullivan from our next set of questions, just do you have any last thoughts or anything else you'd like to leave us with? No, no, I think that this conversation is super important and definitely needed to be had. And I, and I hope that we're able to continue these conversations and that they um, effectuate real change. Perfect. Thank you. Great. So Dr. Sullivan, um, I'd like to ask you if you would mind breaking down for us just how critical um, of a role contraceptives play in the likelihood of an unplanned pregnancy based off your experience and expertise. Yeah, I mean, I first just want to um, thank you for having me um, and know this is such an important conversation. I have found myself really enthralled by the videos um, and just always overwhelmed by the insightful comments of so many people on this topic and just how important they were. And I started taking or writing some down because they were so good. So I, I don't think I can say anything as insightful as some of those on the video, but I will try. Um, you know, I think the first thing is it, uh, in, you know, one of the things I was asked to talk about a little bit is data and, you know, it's public health. Um, we love data, but we also recognize that data is only good as its limitations. Um, but one of the um, data points that we have when we talk about uh, unplanned pregnancy is something that's called the North Carolina Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System. Um, and the last year that we have is from 2018. What that data showed in that for individuals less than uh, 25 years, about 41% um, reported that their pregnancies were unplanned and about 14 additional percent were not sure. So I think that that's really, um, you know, kind of an important statistic, but I think in access to contraception, which I'll talk about is really important, but I think the first thing is that word plan. And one of the things that we are really, really, really try um, and talk about when we talk about public health is this concept of reproductive life planning, right? And this decision that everyone needs to consider and ask themselves repeatedly if and when they want to become a parent. And that's something that should start young, right? And, and really ask that question. And if the answer is yes, then the question is, how can we support you in that goal if it is right away? And if the answer is no, then it is, so how can we support you in preventing it and then achieving your plan? But I think making that reproductive life plan is, is incredibly important. Um, and once that one of that concepts of that plan is if somebody thinks about it and says, I'm not ready to become a parent at this time, then it is, so what do I need to do to accomplish that? And one of those key things, as you mentioned, is access to contraception. So I think that um, making sure that we think about access to contraception in a bigger framework of reproductive life planning is incredibly important. I think one of the other things is looking, though, at access to contraception. Again, going back to data, um, there is something that is administered annually, which is called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is given to middle school and high school students. Um, we have the data right now from 2017. I think the 2019 data just is hot off the presses, but we haven't really had time to quite look at it yet. Um, what it really showed and I, is that um, it asked high school students what per the percent to use a method to prevent any type of method to prevent pregnancy during their last sexual encounter, and there's 20% who reported no. So, you know, I think, um, and Commissioner Rodriguez McDowell also talked about this a little bit, that access to contraception has improved, I think, and I think we need to celebrate some of the achievements that we've made but we still have a long way to go. And it is not until every single person is able to achieve their exact reproductive life plan that we need to stop having these conversations and pushing this um, forward. Wow, thank you. Those are some great stats you were able to give us. <laughs> um, so also I wanted to ask, um, what are some of the health risks associated with unplanned pregnancies in young people that are still growing and developing? Yeah, you know, I think it, that's a really important question. And again, as people think about their reproductive life plan, there are so many factors that come into it, right? But one of them has to be around, we know pregnancy does have health impacts as well as kind of social and economic impacts, and that all needs to be taken into consideration. 
What we have seen for adolescent pregnancy, there are additional health risks, both for the parent as well as for the child. And if for an um, a, a adolescent teen that is pregnant, they have higher risk of anemia, which means that you have low iron. They have higher risk of depression. There's higher risk of something called pregnancy-induced hypertension, so their blood pressure might go up, and then even developing something called preeclampsia, which can result or which can cause both high blood pressure and then affect your organs. There's also higher risks to the infant, and so whether it's preterm birth, so delivering early, um, which can also then result in lower birth weight, and then kind of have some long-term health effects on the baby as well. So one of the things that is incredibly important and in going back to kind of reproductive life planning, the having that plan and planning a pregnancy means that you have earlier access to prenatal care um, and because that can help prevent, prevent a lot of those things as well. But I think it's always important, anyone thinking about the risks um, to consider those health risks. Great, thank you. I think I speak for everybody where we're only about 45 minutes into this discussion. I've already learned a lot. <laughs> Um, so before we proceed, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to leave us with any other thoughts or a message you would like to get across if, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I mean, just again, I think this is such an important conversation um, and encouraging everybody um, who is of reproductive age to continue to kind of ask those questions and to think about resources. I also encourage um, parents, grandparents, right, to have those conversations with their, um, with their kids, with their grandkids, to really make these kind of honest, open conversations about people's life goals, their reproductive life goals, and then provide that support in order to allow everyone to achieve what their goal is. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Um, all right, so we'd like to turn to a third and the last video now. Um, so let's view that and take a look at the importance of sex education as a preventative measure for pregnancies, STIs, and HIV AIDS. Hey, dog, wait. And you guys are about to start, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Wait, where is it? Uh, oh, there you got you. Oh. Oh. Hey, Jackson. Oh, all right. You all know me. My name is Tyler Yarbrough. So a little bit about my council. We advocate for comprehensive sex education and increased sexual and reproductive health services to all young people in the state of Mississippi. We want you to have a seat at the table when legislators are passing legislation that is going to affect your lives. So, uh, Tyler's a senior in high school in Mississippi, a state where the majority of school districts are teaching abstinence only. So, you know, Lee Padme doesn't have this dog. Mm -hmm. You don't have sex education? No. We as far as Tyler and his friends are concerned, that's just not good enough. You do understand that, like, 98% of the guys at our school that have sex use Plan B as, like, their go-to. And that's something that you shouldn't do. That it, it should not replace um, contraceptives like the other ones. Larks are long-acting, reversible contraception. So this is a type of birth control that um, gives you safe um, contraception that lasts uh, a period of time. What does it look like? What? <clears throat> Lark. Oh, Lark. So this is just the acronym for um, the IUD, the patch, the implant, um, the shot. And Tyler, I know that you hold events where you are educating young people about safe sex practices. Right. You do very well in school, have a very promising future ahead of you. Why take on sex education? Like, why is that such a big issue for you? In the state of Mississippi, most of those, um, when we talk about contraceptives at all, they're geared towards showing the negative side of like all of them and rarely showing the positive side of them. And I feel like that with like a lot of my peers, they see the problems. Mississippi consistently ranks among the states with the highest teen pregnancy, HIV, and STD rates in the U.S. Couple that with among the highest rates of people living in poverty and without health insurance. What do teenagers do for fun out here? <laughs> There's nothing for teens to do here. The Mississippi Delta is pretty much known for um, its poverty, for our poor education system. I grew up in poverty. My mom, she was a teen mom. After my dad left, she had to get a job at um, a convenience store in town, um, working $7.25 an hour, raising four kids. 
when teens become teen moms, contract STIs, that contributes to the era of poverty. Advocating for sex education could be a solution to a piece of that problem. If you had the opportunity to directly address mm -hmm. some of your state legislators about this abstinence-only approach, what would you say to them? I would tell them that it's exclusive. It do, it do not reach um, the majority of my peers and young people across the state. Have you had many interactions with uh, legislators who are just completely steadfast mm -hmm. in their positions? We went to lobby um, in Jackson, and there was one legislator who um, he pretty much told us that um, if kids just start going to church, they wouldn't be engaged in all of these risky um, sexual behaviors. It's hard to like just counteract that so many people are not abstaining, so many people are sexually active. In Mississippi, 48% of high school students have had sex by the time they finish the 12th grade, the highest rate in any U.S. state. And 44% of sexually active students reported not using condoms. That's something this women's health clinic in Tylerstown of Clarksdale sees firsthand. Our pregnant patients, we see a vast majority of teenage pregnancies. To what do you attribute those high numbers? Number one, um, you know, education, what they've been taught in school, and here in Mississippi, you know, teachers are limited to what they can teach students. There are people who don't believe that sex should be talked about in school at all, that the responsibility of talking to kids about sex should be the parents only. How do you respond to that? The parents are afraid to talk about it. When I was growing up, my mother tried to have a conversation with me. I laughed, she turned red, and it was over. If patients can come here and get information from their medical providers, why is it necessary in schools to teach sex, sex education? There's a barrier with parents. They don't feel that they can ask their parent to come here, so they need it in school because they're going to school. When you have to ask to come here, because most can't drive, then the first red flag to the parent is, what are you doing? I don't mean to offend anyone, but I have a 16-year-old and I want someone talking to her and for her to be able to ask questions if needed. I think that's huge for these kids. In the real world, abstinence is not all they need to know. They need to know what's available to them. Abstinence only is a misnomer that has been placed on the teachings of risk avoidance. But let me tell you something about what smoking does. So the same public health principles that are applied to avoiding other risks that are harmful to young people's health, why not apply it to sex? Don't smoke, don't drink. Why not don't have sex until you are in a mutually monogamous, committed relationship? Dr. Frieda McKissick-Bush serves on Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant's task force to reduce teen pregnancy. But we now know that the brain is not fully mature for making those executive decisions until you're in your mid-20s. So asking a 14-year-old or 15-year-old to be making long-term decisions considering effect is inappropriate. So there are consequences of the hookup culture that go beyond the immediate gratification. Sex is not just a physical event, it's emotional. Many of the young people end up having depression. Young people who are sexually active actually make lower grades. Dr. McKissick Bush helped shape guidelines for the implementation of Mississippi's sex ed law. She stands by some of its most controversial restrictions, including the ban on condom demonstrations and on mixed gender classrooms. I think young ladies in particular are more modest. Our experience has been that when the males are present in the classroom, that they may not freely express themselves. The purpose was to allow them, both males and females, to freely express themselves, get their questions answered. I personally believe that we need to have mixed gendered classrooms, and right now the state of Mississippi says that they must be single gendered. I also feel like that it shames um, women and girls the most. I've like actually been in school where 
if a girl like is sexually active, um, it is seen as something that is so bad. But when like a male does it, um, he's like praise. So let's start with the biggest sexual orientation. So that's something that we also want to um, break to, like gender roles and gender stereotypes. We want to reach out to the LGBTQ community, those who are already um, sexually active, those who have children. Tyler's mom, Kimberly, never got that kind of outreach. Today, she's a nurse, but her journey there wasn't easy. By age 21, she was a mother of four. We didn't have that when I was in school. Our parents, you know, they didn't even want to talk to us about sex. The sex talk was, don't do it. Nothing about contraceptive, nothing about, you know, having a baby, STIs, nothing, just don't get pregnant. If I had access to that education and the resources, I wouldn't have become a teen mom. What do you think about the fact that you are the motivation for Tyler to try and advocate for more sex education in school? Tyler know the struggle firsthand. He know the struggle of me being a single parent, me trying to work, trying to go to school, even living in low income housing, getting welfare, getting food stamps. No one can tell me how that feel because my kids know. They know that I slept on a floor, on a mattress for three years. Did, I, I didn't care. I'm very proud of Tyler. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> love you more. <laughs> Before anything, there is something called family planning, OK? Whatever the case might be, when you start dating and getting to know someone, you have to have those like conversations. Like, what do you see? How many kids do you want? Um, you know, how, how would we raise them? Your kids are going to depend on you so much. If somebody grows up in a really stable environment with parents who are there, yeah, maybe sometimes we're in a hurry, the house is a mess, but that's their house. Those are their parents. And that is a big part of who we are in our self-esteem. When we talk about sex ed, what a lot of people don't understand is that it involves like a lot of self-respect, you know, and really owning your body, like you're in charge. And if we had more students having the opportunity to talk about these things, there would be healthier sexual relationships. Can you confidently say that you are helping to raise um, sexually responsible young adults? All right, we'll give it up for Monroe High School Sex Squad. I think I have a lot to do with it. I'd like to believe that. It's just about having conversations. Let's talk about it. We're reproducing, we're falling in love, where that's never gonna end. Social media might change, the gadgets that we use might change, but sex is here to stay, and there's only new discoveries, and how unfortunate if we leave our kids out. I love it, super impactful. All right, so Jessica, I'd like to turn to you for my next set of questions. Um, if you would, please, um, you know, detail for us what the benefits of comprehensive sex education are, um, you know, just from your knowledge, but if you would also like to provide us with some um, examples that you've witnessed yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to um, explain to everybody that I am an educator, a health educator through Planned Parenthood. And so I provide comprehensive sex education to um, that is outside of the CMS system. So I primarily work with um, after school programming and through uh, community organizations. So I do think that before we talk about the benefits of self, um, comprehensive sex education, I think it's important to define really what it is. So comprehensive sex ed is education that moves beyond um, an abstinence only approach. And it provides students with knowledge, attitude, and a skill set that allows them to make healthy and appropriate choices in their lives that they feel is best for them. So it can be taught in a way that is developmentally appropriate from, you know, kindergarten to the 12th grade covering a broad range of topics such as starting in elementary school, starting with 
concepts like consent and safe touch and safety and, you know, when to call 911, that all, you know, correlates with sex education because it talks about how to take charge of your own body and how to prioritize its safety. And so then moving um, to middle school and high school, that's when um, things start to become full circle and we, um, you can start talking about topics such as puberty and personal hygiene, healthy relationships, healthy self-esteem, and um, contraceptive options, of course, and how to best protect yourself from contracting an STI and or HIV AIDS. Um, contrary to popular belief, though, comprehensive sex ed does emphasize that abstinence is the healthiest choice for teens right now, but it's tight, it's comprehensive because we want to provide teens with all of the knowledge to equip themselves to let them know just so they have the knowledge and let let them let themselves think about what the healthiest choice is for them. And so that is why when it's comprehensive, it's super beneficial because it gives them the autonomy and empowerment to make their own decisions because the, the education that we're providing is medically backed and scientifically accurate. Um, so they're empowered to take matters into their own hands and they are well equipped with the knowledge and the information. Thank you. Yeah, that is such a great point. Mm -hmm. um, could you also explain to us some of the long-term effects of re receiving comprehensive sex education in a school setting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on the comprehensive health education that I teach. So the curriculum that I teach is backed by the CDC. And it evidence has shown that when teens complete the programming that I'm done with, um, they complete it like the whole seven week program, they are 15% less likely um, to, well, there's 15% more likely to delay sexual activity. And so I theorize that that's because the education curriculum has provided them with all of the knowledge that, and so it kind of reduces that curiosity um, they, they know what contraceptive methods are out there. They know the risks that come with an unprotected um, sexual encounter. They know now like, oh, this can result in an STD. And so they're more cautious because we are providing them with a general holistic approach when it comes to education instead of just saying, don't do it. When we say don't do it, it's like, well, what is it? Like, what does it mean? Like, um, what happens if I do this? So I do think those are the benefits, um, well, specifically on my end. So when it comes to a school setting, I do think that the video touched on, you know, school is a safe place for a lot of kids. Um, we don't know the background that, or what um, students' households are like. And so being able to come to a safe place with a teacher that is, a, um, that is certified in multi multiple health education curriculums, um, they're able to receive medically accurate information in a school setting. And when teens aren't receiving that in an academic type of setting, they are resorting to other methods to get um, sex education, whether that be through peers um, social media, which is rampant, um, our TV, and even pornography. Um, a lot of teens in my experience have disclosed that, you know, if I'm not receiving this in school, like I have nowhere else to go and turn to. And so um, with it being in an academic institution and being surrounded by their peers, I think they can challenge those things that they see on a daily basis and say like, hey, like I saw this on TV, but that seemed really wrong. And then I can ask my health education teacher about it. And my health education teacher can debunk that myth and actually say, well, no, this is the actual scientifically right way. Like actually, did you know that you can get an STD through oral sex? Um, I bet you didn't know that. So it can be a place where we can challenge the um, popular, conceptions of what sex are in the media and through other avenues. Um, furthermore, I think it's important 
to think about LGBTQ teens in this instance. Um, LGBTQ teens are uncomfortable talking about their sexual orientation and gender identity some of the time um, with a trusted adult. And so in a school setting, comprehensive sex education specifically ensures that these identities um, are validated. Um, so that's, that is another benefit. And school in and of itself well, requires it to be like a continuing conversation. You know, they move through grades. Um, I talked about in the last um, question how sex education can be through kindergarten to the 12th grade. So it's normalized when it's through a school setting. It becomes a part of their daily um, subject, like social studies or math. Um, so it becomes a part of a normal conversation. And I think that those are one of the biggest benefits. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing about um, how CMS is working on creating this as a norm. Um, thank you so much. Awesome, thanks, Jessica. Before I hop over to Jennifer Dillahara, do you have any remaining commentary or commentary unrelated to those questions that you'd like to provide us with, or do you think that covers it? Yeah, I think that mostly covered it. I'm just really happy to be here and again, normalize this these kinds of conversations because I think they, they regularly go unheard. Great, I agree wholeheartedly. All right, Jennifer DeLahara. Hi. Hey. Um, so can you um, shed some light on what the status of Charlotte Mecklenburg School's current sex education programs? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for inviting me to participate. I'm so happy to be here. I'm very passionate about this subject. And first, I'd also like to just say I was so pleased to see in the videos that you showed um, the student advocates. That's pretty awesome. So <laughs> I was really impressed. Um, so I, I guess I kind of have some good news and some bad news. The, the bad news is, is, unfortunately, in many ways, I don't know that we're so very different um, from what we saw going on in Mississippi or the way that the teens we're feeling even in your second video and I, I want to speak to that a little bit but I, I will shed some light on some things I, I think that we are doing well and, and where we can move going forward. Um, I say that to say we actually had a Myers Park High School student approach us, the board, the policy committee back in January to express her concerns much like the teens that you heard speaking in both videos that they just didn't feel like the information that they were getting uh, was applicable to reality. And they advocated for change, which was really impressive. Um, many of the things um, that uh, the young lady um, advocated for in particular, uh, we unfortunately are unable to change because of state law. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. But I, again, I appreciate the advocacy. And I think that here locally, there are many people on the board who would be very um, supportive of additional information um, to be shared. Um, one thing I, I do think is important that I, I spoke with our health specialist who's in charge of the academic curriculum. I also spoke with our coordinator who uh, coordinates with the health department or with the county nurses to get a better understanding. Um, and one thing they both shared to me was that relationship building is really important across the curriculum. The teachers, um, work really hard and, and um, to develop relationship and they do tend to talk about sex education at the end of the semester um, because teachers change again part of that is building relationship over the semester so in hopes that if they do have more personalized questions or concerns if they don't bring them up in the class that they could approach them at a later time and i think that was something really important and unfortunately though um, each year, each child only gets 30 days, between 24 and 30 days of health education, and that's all health. That's the importance of nutrition and physical activity, and so sex education ends up being only, in, the, in a child's career, 135 days total. Um, so that we really are stretched with so many um, mandates, you know, so many math, so many Englishes, so many social studies, everything that trying to fit it in 
um, is a bit of a challenge and um, you know some of that priority has to change at the state level as well. Um, so much like what the young teens mentioned, um, our curriculum based on state law is very abstinence um, driven. And if you don't mind, I just thought it would be important, I'll read a couple of these just so that folks really can understand, uh, hopefully our participants, how limiting this can be. The very first part of the sex um, law if, if I'll call it that, education uh, law says that teach that abstinence from sexual activity outside of marriage is the expected standard for all school age children. And number two is present techniques and strategies to deal with peer pressure um, to, um, so to offer positive reinforcement to encourage abstinence and present reasons why absence is the better choice. It goes on and on and on. And I just tell you that before we get to contraceptives, which we do talk about, the, the base, the first part of it is all abstinence driven. And then this one is kind of, was the most shocking one that I uh, learned about back in January. Um, number four reads, teach that a mutually faithful, monogamous, heterosexual relationship in the context of marriage is the best lifelong means of avoiding sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV AIDS. And that's directly from uh, the law statute 115.81.30. Um, so that's kind of the framework with which we have to work. And I'm not sure that most people, you know, just common parents, again, I'm a parent, I have a, two teenagers, a 12 year old and a 14 year old. And until January, uh, when I came on the board and started looking at this more closely, did I understand that that's what our state legislature has for us. So, we do have challenges. I know someone in the in the chat asked if we provide contraceptives, and uh, that is also against the state law. The very end of the law says that um, contraceptives, including condoms and other devices, shall not be made available or distributed on school property. Now, what we are able to do is refer students to um, county health, and, and that could be through our teacher, it could be through the school nurse, um, so we can make referrals for more information and certainly contraceptives is taught all the FDA approved contraceptives are um, talked about, but um, I think the key here is that relationship piece because I, you know, knowing that they're not really allowed to talk about other um, anything else it would be a relationship established hopefully and i do know the teachers are given this guidance that you know to answer questions with you know correct information if it's presented and if not appropriate in front of the class then in a one-on-one -on -one setting um, so we hope that more education certainly is going on i i will tell you um you know, it's a constant battle. I mean, even as of late, uh, here in the past few months, we had some state legislators who wanted to bring forth that right now in the state, you opt out of sex ed. So a letter goes home and it says, you know, we intend to teach your child sexual education curriculum this year, go to this link and you can review the information. And if you decide to opt out, please sign this letter. If the parent doesn't send the child the letter back in or the child doesn't bring it in, then they get the information. Some of our legislators don't think, it thinks it should be the opposite, that all parents should opt in, which of course I don't agree with. And it didn't come to fruition, but it was spoken about just this year, just a few months ago. So we're still battling this where we have legislators who want to get it even more restrictive and, and really want to go out of, out of um, their way to make sure that, that children don't have the information instead of lean airing, airing on the side of let's give them the information. Um, so that battle was lost, but um, there, you know, there, there will be more battles to fight, I'm sure, um, unless we, here's the key, here's the good news, we flip or change the leadership in the North Carolina General Assembly, which is where I think is very, um, <laughs> for me personally, is something that I'm very passionate about doing because I know here, at least in Mecklenburg County, I'm, I'm friends with many of our, of our representatives and I know that they are supportive of more comprehensive sex education, um, but because they are in the minority part, party, 
um, those type of bills, should they get presented, are usually not considered and even make it out of committee. So I think that that is a great way for us to think about moving forward is if we want real change, because there's some things we can do here locally to tweak it, but really the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools does not have a lot of power to, to do anything. Um, the, the state law um, supersedes us, if you will. Um, so that's kind of a look at where we are and I think a general overview of some of the challenges um, that we face. Wow, that's amazing. So much information. Thank you. Um, so you kind of touched on this um, and you can get as personal in your beliefs um, as you'd like, but what do you feel or would advise or suggest um, are some opportunities for CMS to improve the curriculum or change it? Well, I think, for example, I was uh, reading our policy, which is the IHAM policy, um, that pretty much what we did is we cut and pasted the, the state law, and then we added a few extra things at the bottom. I was noticing when I was reviewing it the other day that we we could be more explicit in how we go about giving referrals for more information. I think that we could adjust our curriculum um, to state that that's actively taught instead of waiting for, um, for the students to inquire that we could have information even just posted on how to get help at the teen center or whatever the, the, the location is. It, it, it would just need to be covered in our parental consent form. So that's something that I um, spoke with one of our legislative uh, folks today about how we could maybe review that policy to see if I wanted to make sure that my interpretation of the law and the policy was correct. But it looks like we could have a little wiggle room in putting forth more information for referrals on how to actually obtain um, condoms, for example. So that might be something that we want to do. I mean, I personally, um, I know another panelist mentioned LG LGBTQ students and addressing their needs. I mean, from what I'm seeing on how restrictive it is, I I'm curious to know if students do feel safe enough in the classroom the question that I would have for our teachers or, or maybe the head over the academics of it is, is what do, how do you respond? You know, because based on whatever their beliefs are, the individual teachers, I, I, I just can't imagine that it's consistent. And so I, I think that that's something worth looking into because I, I personally would want, um, you know, all of our students to feel comfortable to ask questions and not feel excluded in a way that the law seems to be excluding them. So um, I think that's a good question for us to reexamine is how are we answering questions? And my hope is certainly that we're not um, shutting folks down or as the the young man in Mississippi said telling folks well if they just go to church then this will all work itself out or you know things like that I mean let's let's acknowledge the reality where we are embrace students for who they are and uh, respond more appropriately and I'm not to say that that's not happening I just think that that's a better question for me to dig a little deeper and find out what guidance is given to the teachers on how um to respond. I will say an, another little side note, something we did accomplish this year that was good. Maybe I can end on a good note. You're certainly welcome to answer more questions, but because of a change at the state legislature, we were able to add more information about consent and about sex trafficking. And so that was a huge success. And it was one of the reasons, quite honestly, we went to reevaluate our sex um, education policy back in January when I referenced that the young lady from Myers Park came to speak to us, was because we were adding this new information to make it align to the state law. Um, so that is really good, I think, information and a, a good step forward for all of North Carolina, not just Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Awesome. Thank you for that response. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add upon that? Um, or frankly, um, you know, do you have any comments that you'd like to add towards any of the other panelists questions that um, you had thoughts on? 
Um, I, I did not realize that um, Jessica does the work that she does in the after school programs. And so I'm actually just really happy to know that um, because in maybe in areas that we fall short, uh, if she's able to, to pick it up and keep moving forward and reach children in other ways, I figure the more the merrier. So I'm happy now to know that that exists and can advocate and educate the general public about what is um, available. Great. Yeah, I would definitely encourage all of you to um, collaborate and work together um, moving forward in any way that you possibly can. Um, <clears throat> Before we go into a Q&A, I just wanted to ask all of the panelists, um, you know, now if you've seen all the videos, you've heard all the questions and the responses, is there anything else you've thought of that you'd like to add um, or provide us with? No? I will quickly say that um, after hearing from, from all of the other panelists, it kind of just made me more aware of the work that really needs to be done, um, especially after watching the videos and hearing a lot of things that I have already known just anecdotally and here locally. Um, it's, it's really scary because, you know, I work in HIV advocacy and lobbying work. Um, so we're constantly talking about STDs and you know, um, you know, infection rates and how those fluctuate. And, you know, right now we're in a really high time, like we're really sp spiking high with STDs nationally, but specifically in Charlotte. So hearing about um, how there, you know, seems to be resistance to having more um, positive changes in the policy is very disturbing. So I feel like, you know, religion aside, feelings aside, if you just focus on the science and the data, you know, this is really a serious health crisis that we need to be treating seriously. So I'm very curious to know with, with the law that we have and where things currently are, you know, before there is a flip in the, in the General Assembly, um, hopefully, I think it would be wise to be able to look at the law and try to figure out what you know, what options we have to work within that to be able to provide as much comprehensive sex ed as we can within the parameters that are there. So I know some counties throughout the state um, have been um, a bit flexible with that discretion and have been able to provide more, um, but I think that that's something that we should be able to have a conversation about to see what can be done with what, how things are now. Absolutely, thank you. Did any of the other panelists have any um, remarks they'd like to add before I turn it over to Sarah for um, a Q&A with those of us that are watching? No? All right, then Sarah, feel free to take it away with some questions. Thank you, and thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, this was such a great uh, conversation. I really appreciate you guys all being here and being so um, straightforward with your responses. Um, so if for all of our attendees, you can type questions into the chat and I will read them off to the panelists. Uh, we have a couple that came in. Uh, Jennifer, you uh, answered a couple already. Thank you for doing that. I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, it's, that's perfect. I appreciate that. Um, so one of the questions uh, that came in, and I'm going to change it a little bit um, from Kadena, was about uh, what are other counties doing? So, you know, is there a, is there a model that we can look to, um, even in North Carolina or another state? Um, I, you know, I hear loud and clear that the North Carolina legislature is a huge barrier for us. And I think everyone on this call, and there's a lot of other people that aren't here that are, are doing a lot of really important work to address that. Um, but what can we do today or tomorrow um, that maybe another county in North Carolina is doing um, Jessica, do you have any um, insight into what any other counties are doing that we could look to for um, guidance or a model? Um, in terms of sex education, um, something that um, comes to mind is 
Los Angeles County. But again, as Jennifer said, you know, it really it goes hand in hand with state legislature and what can, you know, be taught in the public school system because in Los Angeles, um, they're allowed to have contraceptives at school and they're allowed to have even emergency contraceptive um, contraceptives at school. And so the sex education in that county, you know, plays off of that. Um, and it talks about how, where else you can obtain contraceptives and how you can advocate for yourself in, in a medical setting. Um, so Los Angeles County is the, one of the model counties in my mind because it really connects the dots with how you are as an individual in society and where you can obtain healthcare and how you can best advocate for yourself. And, but if the legislature is not there, um, you know, where it, and it can't connect, like healthcare services and sex education can't connect, like in the way that it's doing over there, then it's a little bit um, difficult. So I wanted to thank Jennifer for bringing that to our attention because sometimes we forget. Yeah, and I'll just chime in to say that unfortunately, I don't know of any other counties that are doing anything different. We really don't have a lot of wiggle room, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, to go above and beyond what the state law says. Uh, but I can certainly ask, uh, you know, maybe even the folks in Wake County, or and I'm just thinking of of a, an area that might be you know, possibly more progressive than us and in, in thinking about sex, comprehensive sex education to see how their policy differs, but I don't, I don't know of any and how that would play out, unfortunately. Okay. But I do, if you don't mind me just reiterating, um, yes, flipping is very important. That doesn't mean that we can't, even though most of our, de uh, the Democratic um, delegation um, in Raleigh um, most of them are on board with this and believe that we should make some changes, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go ahead if they're your representative and, and email them because they calculate how many people are writing them about issues. And even though they may already be for what we're advocating for, it's nice for them to, you know, be able to say, hey, we have all these people writing us that are wanting this. And so when they speak to the majority party, they can have that data. And we can also, even though they may not be our direct representatives, we can also write the folks who are in um, power, um, the ones holding gavels, uh, the, the head of the Senate and the Speaker of the House, et cetera, and express it to them. I mean, it, it may not be an issue that they're going to take up, but we can certainly write them as well so that they know that there are many people, North Carolinians in general, who are advocating. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so I there was a partner that had mentioned, and I, I'm going to preface by saying that I don't know a lot about this program. D Dr. Sullivan, you might know more about it, but I he I've heard that Guilford County, where Greensboro is, has a really great program for um, adolescents 13 through 19. So North, North Carolina is a state where you don't need parental consent to get contraceptive. That is a state law. So I've heard that they have a program where um, 13 through 19 year olds can get access to any sort of contraception, um, IUDs, condoms, um, the pill, free of charge through the public health department. Um, does anybody know more information about that program or if that's something that possibly we could look into um, implementing here in Mecklenburg? So I can speak briefly. This is Dr. Sullivan. I can't, I actually can't, I don't know specific details about the Guilford County program, so I don't want to talk about that, but I can talk about a couple of specific um, kind of availability here in Mecklenburg County. First, starting with the Mecklenburg County Health Department. Um, you know, as Commissioner Susan um, Rodriguez McDowell mentioned at the beginning, we do um, have two clinical sites right now at the health department. Unfortunately, I'm going to talk generally. Unfortunately, during the time of COVID, obviously, our, some of our services have been interrupted, um, and I can talk specifically about that at the end, but just generally, we offer two clinical sites and um, participate in a Title X program, which does, which is a family planning program that does allow us to provide family planning and reproductive life planning to individuals of all ages. Um, as you mentioned, 
in adolescents are able to come in and provide, and as long as they are capable of informed consent, can provide informed consent and receive services. Title 10 services are based on your in income. For adolescents, it is based on their individual income and is provided on a sliding scale, but does slide down to zero if you meet those income qualifications, which most adolescents do. Um, and we do offer on-site um, all forms of contraception. So this is a service that is available, right? And, um, and something that I think we're really proud to offer. I think there's also another um, clinic that's called Teen Health Connection um, that is a really great clinic um, here in the county that does also provide really great services for teens, um, not just focused on reproductive health, but um, also offers that as well. And I think that's something that should be celebrated. Can I ask you to clarify, are you saying, because um, it was my understanding that teens don't need to have parental consent to receive contraceptives? Correct. That's correct. Sorry, that's yeah. Correct. They, they, yeah, yeah I, they, I thought you had said the opposite, and I just and I just misunderstood what you were saying at the moment. But I think yeah, so there's something they have to be able to provide informed consent. But yes, they can consent on their own um, mm -hmm. in order to do that. Now, I think you know, I think one of the things that is important is our goal is to provide individuals right with the access to services that they need to meet their reproductive life plan. For teens, that does not mean that we tell them, keep this a secret and don't tell your parents, right? Or don't tell anybody, because we understand that for everybody, often they need support and, you know, and assistance with that. And so I think um, while we keep it confidential, right, I think it's important to recognize that this is not a service that is, that is an attempt to keep it from people, right? It's just a service, but they can provide their own consent and they get to make their decisions about who they inform and we support that and encourage them to involve others that will, um, that will help them make that choice. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and I'll also just echo that um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools does the same. I mean, they, they will refer to your teen center, um, but they also simultaneously encourage that, that they uh, reach out to folks and let them know, and that may be their parents if they feel safe to do that. So that is part of the expressed um, teaching as well. Great, thank you. Um, so a question came in, what is something that, and how about we go around to each of the panelists, what is, what is one thing that the people that are watching today, in your opinion, can do to help better access to contraceptives and sex education? We'll start with Dr. Sullivan. Okay. I think, you know, what the first thing that really comes to my mind is really just to continue the conversation. I think sometimes these are conversations that sometimes people shy away from because they think it's controversial, right, or difficult to talk about. And I think the more we normalize this conversation and really talk about how this is something that we absolutely have to get to and continue to talk about, continue to talk to teens about, continue to talk to, you know, um, kind of our friends, family, community members, um, everyone about and really make it a normal conversation. I think that's going to be a big step. Christina, I guess, I, do you want to go next? Who? Uh, Christina. I can go next. Yeah, I definitely want to second what the doctor just said. I think talking about it, particularly in the South, is super important because, as we all know, there is that strong stigma against sex and just talking about it. Um, and, you know, I think some of you mentioned in the comments, like when we don't talk about it, that creates more curiosity. And that's so, that's so true. So I think finding different opportunities to talk about it, whether it be in school, um, collaborations with community partners in churches, even in places of faith, um, <clears throat> being really creative with where that information is being um, brought up, I think is super important. Because you know, as we know, there are some parents who don't want their kids knowing about anything which is not conducive to the public health, broadly to you know, Charlotte and North Carolina and is not indicative of what kids are actually doing. Um, so I think just being able to have honest conversations about that, whether it be with parents, with students, um, and just to continue that dialogue, I think is super important. Thank you, Jennifer, do you wanna go next? Yeah, um, I wrote down the statistic that was in one of the um, videos about how 50% 50, uh, 50 of adolescents were more likely to delay sex after they had a more comprehensive education about it. And I think that's so key. Um, 
also, I couldn't help but notice how in the video how it talked about the um, the abortion conversation had kind of morphed in the political realm with with um, prevention and STD S STIs, um, and and I I think that we need to, we in general that advocate um, for more you know reproductive freedoms and rights um, and justice need to work harder to reframe the conversation because I the, the other folks have seemed to have a bullhorn um, and 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 conflate these issues that sometimes overlap and sometimes don't um, but I think some of our conversations around um, they're, they're worthy points, you know, do we want government making these decisions for us? You know, I don't, I think it's a valid point. Um, you know, I think that some of the things that we typically say um, can be effective, but I'd like to see personally the conversation move toward the fact that the one thing that we know that is a direct factor or indicator that produces fewer unwanted pregnancies and fewer STIs is a comprehensive sex education and really beyond that a, a, a fantastic education for all of our children outside of just sex education but thinking about you know setting kids up for a future um, you know in, in, in for their lives so I, I don't know if I'm saying exactly the way that I want to say it but I'd like to see us reframe because we know that when kids have education and this is not just an American phenomenon it's a worldwide phenomenon children who have better access to education and sex education make different choices and so I just, I think that the focus many times, even for us, you know, I don't know, politicians, if I can call myself that, um, can we can reframe the messaging and make it more powerful and not get caught up in some of the other uh, messaging that tends to squash the conversation. Absolutely, thank you, Jessica. Yeah, I mostly want to um, echo everything that has been said so far. Um, normalizing conversations about contraceptives and again, a comprehensive sex education is the first step because it starts in our own lives before, you know, society notices like a general need for change um, and how, how we can move towards that change. And speaking of that, just, um, I'm looking forward to learning um, how we can get involved locally on how we can work on changing some of these legislations or, you know, people in current um, certain political offices and how we can elect leaders that have our best interest and our best and best interest for teens and what they need, um, I think it are great starting points. Great, thank you. Um, and just a reminder to our participants, you can type questions in the chat for any of the panelists. Um, Christina, I have a question for you. So you do a lot of policy work. Um, so what do you think is the best way for people to stay up to date on changes around this type of issue? So if somebody listening wants to get involved in helping to move the needle or just wants to know if our legislatures are thinking about a bill, like how can people get involved or plug into that work? I would recommend following that, um, that do that work specifically, like would that do like reproductive justice, advocacy and lobbying. I'm thinking of like Planned Parenthood, NARAL, NC, even um, and making sure that you know those organizations normally are able to track relevant um, legislation that is relevant to that issue so more likely I usually find that you know organizations that do that work will be the ones that are sending out action alerts saying oh hey this bill was introduced this is what this bill means this is how you can take action and those are easy ways to be able to stay in the loop because oftentimes there's so much that goes on um, in the media and just with the current news cycle that you know every single piece of legislation doesn't always rise to the top. So being um, super engaged with organizations doing this work 
um, will be important to be able to stay up to date on what's going on and also um, have tools to be able to take action. Excellent, thank you. And a similar question to Dr. Sullivan, I think a lot of us today who are, are doing this work um, got an education on you know, what is available to the residents in our city. I don't think everyone knew that you could go to the public health department and get this. Um, what, it, what would be the best way for the community to know about those resources? Or like, what is the health department doing to uplift those resources so that the community knows that they're available? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question and one that I think we um, take very seriously, you know, related to this topic as well as some of the other kind of important public health initiatives that we are trying to work on. In our strategic business plan, which kind of looks at over the next three years, again, that, you know, got disrupted over the last few months with our COVID response, but yet we still remain incredibly committed to. One of them is really to try and focus on this idea around reproductive life planning and to really empower individuals of all ages to do it. And part of that is through kind of a, you know, media campaign, especially with an emphasis on social media, recognizing that we're really trying to reach individuals of all ages um, to not only you know, introduce the concept of reproductive life planning of sexual health, um, but also to make sure that people know where services are available and how they can come, um, come reach them. And so that is something that we're kind of actively working on and really take very seriously. So, and I think as while I realized this, because I realized when I was talking, you know, I've been focused knowing kind of the topic around um, our, we, we talked about kind of Title 10 and our um, access to reproductive life planning and contraceptive services, you know, are we also provide testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections. Um, and that again is free of charge for all county residents. Um, and that is also something that individuals of all ages, uh, kind of starting in adolescence can consent to. So. Great, thank you very much. Um, so no, another question that came in, and I'll, I'll just open this up to anyone who wants to answer. Um, so you are, the panelists, you are sitting on a panel to talk about access to contraceptives and sex education. And so you've been chosen because you, you do work around these topics and these issues. So does anybody want to share, um, you know, why you do this work? Um, is there a personal story or, um, you know, why do you, why have you chosen this to be the work that you do? Well, I didn't set out to, to do reproductive health per se. I feel like I went into the work that I do wanting to help people and then realizing that changing policy helps people and then realizing healthcare impacts people and then realizing that HIV is a is a illness that isn't given a lot of attention and is considered you know to be a marginalized illness so i you know to me it made sense to want to focus on that but once i've gotten into the work and into the field i've really learned a lot about how important um sexual health is to your broader health care and I do think that sexual health care is health care and I do think that growing up in this in the south I and mean, I grew up in Miami so I grew up way in the south but um, I grew up in a conservative home and you know I got the sex talk don't get pregnant and that was it there was no how do you get pregnant how do you prevent pregnancy and I know I'm not the only one and I also know that you know friends of mine were having sex even though they were in the same situation that I was in so knowing the facts, knowing, you know, how things operate the way that they are, you know, I feel like it's important to be able to advocate for that information to be broadly put. That way everyone can make that individual decision whether to or not to have sex and how they want to have sex. But I think that being able to have that education is really important because a lot of us aren't able to, to even get that in school. Like I didn't even get it in school. So I think it's super important um, that other kids aren't in that situation, that they that way they're able to feel empowered. Yeah, I was just about to uh, say about the tail end of what Christina was saying. I personally believe that education is what is a force for change and is 
something that drives empowerment. It's like the first step into someone's empowerment journey. And so um, from a young age, I've always realized that topics about our bodies, um, you know, are always avoided. And it doesn't matter if you grew up in a conservative or a more liberal area. I grew up right, right outside of DC. And, you know, that's one of the most liberal places in the state of Virginia. And still the you know the sex education that i received was subpar and just societally i think this entire subject is taboo um and so <laughs> that has always inspired me to be in the line of work that i um was do um, that i'm currently doing because i want to just help normalize these discussions and hopefully start some kind of change for our next generation um you know the if I work with younger populations and reverse this kind of thinking, um, and even if I work with parents and, and if parents can reformulate the way that they've been taught about sex, they can reverse generational cycles about how we think about our bodies and sex and empowerment. And so that has always been an inspiration for me. Thank you to both of you for sharing those stories. Um, Jennifer, I have a question for you, um, a question that came in. So let's say that, so we hear about the limitations uh, based on the state law. So in the age of social media, kids are able to have access to information pretty readily. So what outlet can we provide to students that want to learn more, that are proactive about seeking out that education? Um, you know, is there a difference between what's mandated that we have to provide and what we can provide as a supplement to those that are seeking more information? And if so, like, what could that look like? The only thing that I know of right now is that we're able to make referrals um, to the county, to the, and, and I'm sorry, doctor, I forget the name of it wrong, the teen center, what's it called? Yeah, Teen Health Connection. Teen Health Connection, thank you so much. Um, for more information, um, you know, it, it probably, I mean, realistically, I, I, I tried to ask, like, functionally, how does this play out in the classroom, you know, and this was just one teacher's perspective, but but it, it varies, I'm sure, to a certain degree, depending on what type of teacher that you get. But I would not be surprised also if you have many teachers who would want to share more, but really don't want to ever get in a position where their job would be you know, at risk. And so they just don't beyond passing on the referrals. Um, I mean, you know, it, you're right. My kids are teenagers and it's amazing uh, what they know. Uh, and, but I'm also grateful because they, um, they do talk to me and they ask me questions and I'm, and I'm glad to, to, that I've been able hopefully to create a household where they can ask questions and that, you know, I was going to answer the question about my personal experience too. And if you don't mind, I'll just end with this because my, my parents didn't really talk much about it a little bit. Their parents didn't talk to them at all. And my mom ended up pregnant her senior year of high school. She graduated, but nevertheless, it's interesting how that plays out because she could have become a parent who decided, wow, this happened to me because of my lack of education, so I'm going to embrace more education. Um, she didn't really. I still got that mm, let's, out of sight, out of mind. Let's just not talk about it. Um, but then when she found out that I was sexually active as a teen, it was interesting because the first thing she did was take me to the doctor and have me put on birth control, like no questions asked. And so it was interesting kind of her perspective on it because she knew like the end result, but she still couldn't get around like the talking. <laughs> and so I probably drive my kids nuts now because I want to talk about everything all the time in response to that. So it's just interesting how the chain either continues or slightly modifies over time or is sometimes flat out broken. Um, but you know, uh, I, I just thought I would mention that from a personal standpoint, kind of how that has affected me directly. And, and for that, I'm grateful. You know, I didn't get the talk, but I'm sure that that, you know, helped prevent, you know, uh, an unwanted pregnancy. So I'm grateful that my mom had the wherewithal to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have about 13 minutes left and um, let's, 
we don't have any more questions coming in, but I have a question and I'm hoping that you all will take a shot at it. Um, so I think a big theme of tonight's conversation is this is really important to all of us. We are not where we wanna be. We have some barriers to getting to where we wanna be. Um, but if you, if someone said to you, tomorrow I want you to put in place a new policy and you don't really have to consider getting the votes, you know, appealing to a certain demographic or a certain voter, voter you could just implement one policy, what would that policy be and why? So let's start with Dr. Sullivan. Wow, that's a really great question. I wish you hadn't started with me because I don't know. <laughs> um, one policy. If somebody else has a great answer right away, please jump in um, and save me while I'm thinking about this. I think there's. Hmm. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, does somebody <laughs> want to go? Does somebody want to go first? Yeah, I can go. Um, really quickly, just something that came to mind, and I think it does correlate with the question that um, was given to me earlier today in the panel. Um, I would just, uh, firstly, the policy would be about sex education in public school because most students in any county attend public school the most, so we wanna be hitting um, places where most people are going. And so I would start the sex education process from kindergarten and move it up to the 12th grade. And it would be a designated um, class. <laughs> so it, it's, and it would establish, and it would have just as much legitimacy as any other subject because it's dealing with the autonomy of your own body. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like an empowerment class and um, how to advocate for yourself personally. So it would, you know, require that class and, that's emotionally appropriate and, um, for each developmental stage. So again, kindergarten, elementary school, really talking about bodily autonomy and stranger danger and saying no and consent and then moving on and then just having it become full circle. Um, so by the time that a, um, a child graduates from high school, they are well equipped and they have all of this knowledge and it's been normalized and they can talk about it with their peers um, in a healthy way. Um, I think that is, thank you all um, in the chat box, thank you. Um, I think that is something that I would prioritize if I had that liberty. I'll yeah. kind of add on to that because you, you've um, said things many sim similar to what I was thinking in the sense that if I could change policy, and we do start in fifth grade. Um, someone had asked that earlier um, mm -hmm. with some basic anatomy, you know, hygiene type lessons, and then, and then the lessons carry on through middle school and, and throughout high school. Um, but I think it should start earlier. Um, and I would advocate for a more um, comprehensive, like well-rounded type of just um, like even attitudes towards sex, because I do think that it's still rooted many times in a sense of um, it should be shameful, you know, uh, in our society. And I would like to see that change that it is a natural um, uh, desire for most folks and we can make smart choices that keep us healthy, um, but treat it like the natural thing that it is. And I, I, I just feel like um, learning what you said about bod bodily autonomy, consent, understanding, um, just start, I don't know, starting earlier on to help people feel more empowered that they are in control of their bodies, that they can make decisions and, that more open environment to to have the deeper conversations it's needed in our society across the board i would also uh piggyback off of that and add that you know making sure that you know all students are included in this you know i went to public school for part of my education and i went to private school and you know private schools have a lot of discretion as to what to include what not to include and of course, sex that always gets left out. Um, so me, making sure that, you know, all students 
um, have access to that information is important. And being able to mandate comprehensive healthcare that positively shows different kinds of identities, different kinds of orientations, different kinds of relationships. I didn't, I, I hated hearing the whole push about marriage and, you know, forcing that as the only vehicle for sex, or I guess I feel like that's just bananas. I mean, we wouldn't want kids thinking that that's the only way, that marriage is the only way. It's an, it is an, an option and we should let them know that that is an option, but not just solely focusing as the only option. If I could just add, as you were saying that, it hit me. I, I think the lawmaker's intention is to think about um, discouraging premarital sex, but I'm just thinking about how, how many kids are sitting there thinking, well, my parents are divorced. So does that mean they never have sex with their other partner? I mean, there's so many family dynamics and I think their original intention probably, I don't know, was thinking, you know, because they're young, to keep them from wanting to have premarital sex, but there's so many different family dynamics or people who choose not to get married at all for whatever reason, um, you know, helping, helping us to embrace that so that the children can look to their parents. Um, should they be um, same sex couple or a couple that's chosen not to get married or divorced or whatever and seem more accepted in our society. Yeah. And this is Dr. Sullivan. I think, um, one thing I, that I would also add when it comes to policy is, you know, one of the things we've been talking about is access and empowering individuals to achieve their reproductive life plan. And we know one of the biggest barriers is cost, you know, and I was able to highlight kind of, you know, the work that the health department is able to do, but we know that that doesn't, you know, solve all of the issues, right? And that there's still lots of people who are unable to achieve their reproductive life plans due to cost. And so if you think about a policy, cost should not play a barrier in any of this, you know, and we talk about access to not just reproductive health and sexual health, but healthcare in general. We talk about expanding Medicaid and we talk about health insurance and access to services. There was some, you know, again, a magic policy where cost no longer was a, 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 was a factor and people really had access to everything that they um, wanted. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, that's the world, all of that. That's the world I wanna live in. Thank you so much. Um, so for our panelists, please feel free to drop in the chat box um, any like social media links, websites, emails, anything that you want to uplift um, for the work that you're doing. Um, I really, 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 or we all really appreciate you being with us today. Um, just a plethora of, of knowledge and um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing for our community. This session was recorded, so we are going to uh, put it on social media so you can Take a look at it, please share it. I'll also make sure to link uh, the videos that we watched today. I, I know I saw at least one comment asking for the videos, so we'll put those um, on social media so you can share those as well. Um, but that's all I have. Amber, um, anything else from you tonight? Um, no, I think that covers it. I just want to also um, give you all my thanks. This was amazing. It was informative for myself, um, so I really appreciate it. And um, I can't wait to look into the next steps that we use to collaborate together and work together. Absolutely. Anything else from panelists? Anything else you want to say or call out before we end? Sure, I will. If um, I know I mentioned that in Mecklenburg County, uh, most of our delegation in Raleigh is supportive of the ideas we're all advocating for here, but there we are only five or six seats in each house, the House or the Senate, of flipping um, to, to get the majority. So if you are interested, if you're watching in a list of where those seats may be in Wake County or, or the Burlington area, or there's one in Cabarrus County, where maybe you could, you know, get on board a $20 donation to a campaign or phone bank, you know, to help get some of these folks elected, we really do um, have a chance of making a change in Raleigh. And I, you, you can certainly email me and I can get you more information on how you can get connected. Awesome, thank you. All right, well with that, um, we will end. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy um, in, the, in these difficult times. Please take care of yourself and um, have a good rest of your night. Thank you for joining us tonight.